Hi, everyone. I'm Liz Farrell, Artistic Director of Painting, Drawing, and Printmaking in our Artists in Residence program. Welcome to Anderson Ranch, Ranch's Artists in Residence slide night. I want to welcome our virtual participants watching tonight as well. Before we begin, please silence your cell phones. Tonight we will hear from 14 residents who are spending five weeks here at the ranch, working in the studios and building a fantastic community of artists. But to begin, Anderson Ranch would like to acknowledge that our campus resides on the traditional ancestral territory of the Ute people who've called the Roaring Fork Valley and beyond home for over 800 years. It's an honor and a pleasure to introduce our artists and residents. Hello, um, my name is Melinda Rosenberg. And when I was thinking about how to um, talk about my work tonight, I was just uh, offered the opportunity to get a tattoo, my first tattoo of my life. And so I was talking with the tattoo artist about what it would look like. And <clears throat> I thought of this dying dogwood branch that had a blossom, but also some roots and some decay. And I think that for me, she said, well, why? And I said that it's because I'm interested in the life cycle, life and death, and the wood is really a vehicle to talk about that. And um, so anyway, that's why. And I think that's the crux of my artwork is sort of the, the mystery of life and death and how that happens. Anyway, I, I also have a lot of other interests. This is um, just a very simple piece that combines two of my interests, one in something that's more, I think of as fakey, the painting part, and one that's more natural, the wood part. And uh, when you look at this from different angles, it changes quite a bit, and that's something I'm also interested in. Um, this is a series that I was hoping to work on during my residency. Um, it's called the Shield series. And um, in this, uh, each shield is representing a woman. And the holes um, are something I'm going to explore more and try and get more of a sense of vulnerability into the shield. So it's strong and powerful, but vulnerable. And that's, I do a lot with old wood and new wood. And then I also have an interest in painting. Um, this is painted on ribbed uh, pine that's sold at Home Depot for fencing. And I spray painted it and painted it with many, many layers. And it's got the old wood on the outside and this kind of painting surface on the inside. And uh, that's it. <laughs> I'm pressing it and going. Oh. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Natalie Woodlock. I'm primarily a printmaker. And I've been sort of making this series of um, queer portraits of my friends that are all, I silk screen them on satin banners. Um, uh, yeah, so this is a friend. I started during this, uh, during this series when I was living in New Orleans. I lived there for 10 years. Um, yeah, and so I'd photograph people. Um, they're all kind of nude portraits as well. So it is kind of also about a love of like queer and trans bodies. Um, sorry, I wasn't expecting to be up so soon. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> um, yeah, and so these are sort of um, sort of like a they're like commemorative and like celebratory, both of the individual people, but also um, of a community as a whole. And so I'm interested in kind of, oh, sorry, and they're double-sided as well. So they kind of sit 
or they hang, sorry, in the middle of a space and with a brass rod at the top and then the banners that this is the other side of the banner in the previous slide. Yeah, and so I'm sort of working, this is what I'll be working on here is um, I've got a bunch of drawings that are ready of, um, of friends and I'll be silk screening them onto satin and maybe sewing them while I'm here or sewing them when I, yeah, return. And it's sort of loosely, I'm interested in like subculture as well and it's kind of like a, um, loosely a sort of queer punk kind of community of people that I'm sort of photographing and drawing. And that's the back of the previous banner. And I'm sort of looking also at this kind of like commemorative vernacular aesthetic as well. So I'm interested in kind of the way like poor and working class communities um, have very specific kind of ways of commemorating people that are, you know, dear to people in the community but unknown to outsiders. So that's as kind of a similar thing. I'm kind of doing portraits of people that are super iconic to me but sort of you know, as equally um, unfamous. All right. Hello, um, my name is Monica Creel. Um, I am a Mexican American artist. I am a daughter of immigrants. Um, my work primarily focuses on the practice and exploration of dualities. Um, for me and my identity, it was always, I felt like I wasn't really American or Mexican enough. And in my work, I really like to push those same boundaries in art and design. Um, I grew up, um, my parents are laborers, so I grew up accompanying them to work sites, um, cleaning homes on construction sites, and so, Everything I do is kind of an homage to them as immigrants and their sacrifices coming to this country. Um, it's a huge reason why I feel I can do what I do today. So this is a plaster painting. Um, it is on panel. Um, and all of my paintings are plaster on, on wooden panels. Um, and everything I use you can find at Lowe's or Home Depot. It's very um, usual. Um, but I try to use these materials as a way to elevate um, the, my own roots and where my family comes from. Um, this is another plaster painting. This, this one draws from um, experiences of bathing in the rivers in Mexico. Um, I think my art has really become a practice, a practice of self-exploration, a permission of um, self-identity. Um, and taking the things that I grew up being embarrassed about, like bathing in rivers because we didn't have access to showers when we went to Mexico, um, really elevating those, those things and, and bringing them into the contemporary art space where I feel like they're not, they're not talked about. Um, this is a pl plaster mantle. Um, it's made with birch wood, foam core, and plaster, of course. Um, and a lot of the things I make, I make, um, out of want or necessity, I wanted a mantle and we lived in an apartment at the time and I thought, well, I'm just gonna make one. Um, and so I, I like, again, to play with that interplay and those dualities and it's helped me have an acceptance of self but also like a purpose of life. So um, here you can see plas uh, plaster lighting, plaster furniture and a wooden chair. Um, and um, that is my work. So, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Erin Elizabeth Adams. I um, am very grateful to be here and with all of you all. It's just an amazing gift. I've been saying it over and over again, it's really true. So I make installations, sculptures, paintings. Um, I do multidisciplinary work, performance and video is also part of my practice. I use many different mediums, but tend to use salvage furniture parts 
and street advertising materials in most works. <clears throat> My current work from 2024 considers the nature of healing and regeneration of myself. I recently had um, brain surgery, which was benign, but I did go through that. And so I had a lot of time to sit around and think about what I was making <laughs> for many, many years. And the work is totally new and different. I'm excited about it. So this is some of the new work I'm using furniture parts and just everything I find on the side of the road and sort of, uh, I feel like it's, I'm lucky all the time of what I find and, and keep, you know, putting it back together. It's sort of just like putting myself back together a little bit. And I also think the work speaks to our planet and community, some recycling material, upcycling material. Um, this series is called uh, Various Influence Cy Cycling Through, and it speaks to erosion and destruction, but also maybe the save a little bit. Um, let's see. I'm also, for a long time, worked as a contractor, a painting and decorating contractor, so I would make living uh, walls like this for clients. And um, while I'm here at Anderson Ranch, I'm going to figure out how to make them come together somehow. These recycled furniture pieces, salvage materials, and living materials. And I'm also sprouting mushrooms to go into the installations as well. So I'm really excited about it. And once again, I'm really, really grateful to be here. I'm also a painter and I've been making paintings for a long time. So this series is from the street advertising material I mentioned. And these are women artists. The whole series is women artists, uh, basically put into the context of different museums in Los Angeles. So that's me. Hello everyone, my name is Jordan Tiberio and I'm a photographer based currently in Brooklyn, New York. Um, my work is heavily inspired by my childhood and the imaginative world that was built for me by the women who raised me. So I spent a lot of time as a child and a teenager um, with my mother's mother, my Nana. So she's a retired art teacher who spent most of her days painting and drawing the sprawling beauty of her gardens, local landscapes, portraits of her family um, and of other women. And so at her house, my sisters and I would have tea parties and make scarecrows and fairy houses and paint alongside her at her kitchen table. So these were really formative years of my life. Um, she introduced me to the magic that art holds and how you can create your own universe with your hands. Um, and so this first image, I think it's really important to like introduce my Nana when I talk about my work. Um, and this is what I like to call a portrait of her that we made together in her garden, which is one of my favorite places on earth. Um, and while typically portraits are of people's faces, I just think there's so much history and beauty in just the hand um, and how much this hand has guided me through my journey as an artist as well. So I was born and raised in Rochester, New York, which is the birthplace of Kodak, where both of my paternal grandparents worked. Um, so photography has always been present in my life in one way or another, and sometimes I like to think it was in the water up there. Um, uh, it was also present back in my Nana's house. So under her couch amongst dust bunnies and paper dolls was this old tea tin of photographs that I would always pull out, and I still do when I go back home. Um, and it's full of images from the early 1900s to the 1980s of my family members on that side, growing and aging and changing. Um, and I knew long before I even made my own photographs that one day I wanted this box under my couch that I could pull out and share, you know, years, decades of my life with future loved ones. Um, so while I'm not a documentary photographer by any means, I shoot more kind of like staged realities. I recall these vernacular images from the amateur shooters in my family and a lot of my work by mimicking the color palettes that are now nostalgic um, and appreciating the accidental beauty of their compositions, which were often of otherwise mundane moments from everyday life. 
So I became fascinated by wondering why they photographed the things that they did, um, and thus my love for photography as an art form began. So I like to refer to my work personally as the odd and the ordinary, and I repeat this mantra to myself whenever I'm making work or trying to figure out what to, to create of, something of, um, as a way to challenge myself to just see the world a little bit differently. Um, I want to invite people to spend at least a minute or two with my images, questioning what it is they're looking at or how it was achieved. Um, and since we live in a world that is already very oversaturated in photographic imagery, in order to achieve this, I like to make use of texture and color to form my narratives. So I often use mirrors, screens, mylar to manipulate my images inside of the camera versus after the fact in Photoshop, um, adding to the playful nature of my layered storytelling. Um, and then these past, these last three images that I've been showing are from a larger body of work that I made during a residency in France titled You Have Touched Me and I Have Grown. And it's a visual love letter to the womanhood, to womanhood that explores the transformative value of relationships between women, how these bonds shape our personal growth and encourage bodily autonomy. And it's yet another ode to the romantic rural life that I grew up in um, and my constant like pursuit of it no matter where I am in the world. So that's me, thank you. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Jennifer Masley. I am an artist based out of, my studio is based in Akron, Ohio. Um, my practice, I've always been a, a maker since I was a young child. Um, and I think until recently I've realized that like, my approach to making has been very like intuitive and um, I think not as vulnerable as it has started to become in the last like year or two. Um, there's always been some kind of cryptic autobiography element to it. Like this work came from thinking about like stuffed animals and like childhood. And um, I do get really attached to the process. And like, I do like to kind of let go of um, total familiarity with forms as well. So. Like this started out as like a sewn object with uh, mattress foam that I soaked in porcelain and burned out. Um, that's an incredibly toxic um, process and I do not do that anymore, but it creates interesting results. And I'm also very attracted to like the way things naturally like kind of sit and like slump and feel like they're a part of the world. Um, and then attached to it is chewed bubble gum, like having I like having a bit of like an ick to some stuff just cause it's like, what is that? Like I think it draws in the viewer um, and it's a way that I can like directly be a part of the work. Um, I also really love objects and like understanding the history of like where they came from or like what they're made out of. Um, this was a brief uh, exploration of work where I found the series of decorative fruit objects um, Northeast Ohio has a ton of mid-century modern thrift stores and a bunch of like random stuff. And I, I found these, pro these objects that were originally sculpted somehow to look like wood, cast in plastic. And I, I chose to continue the process by making another mold and then casting it with wood filler, um, trying to like take a step back and a step forward at the same time of like thinking about where the material comes from um, and like where it could potentially lead. Um, my process again is pretty intuitive. Um, I often start off with an instinct to make something. Um, I also spent a lot of time in my art education learning as many things as possible and it's taken a while for it to kind of settle into the place that it's at right now. Um, so thinking about singular objects like the last two images and then this is like an in-between of like object installation. Um, I built the, the base for this um, and again thinking about objects and like a contemporary perspective of like how do we use our kitchens, like how do we use these objects that could end up in thrift stores potentially, um, or even the processes of like slip casting um, and the idea of like usefulness versus like aesthetic decoration. Um, and then this image and the next one are from a project that I did over the summer in 2023. Um, I had access to this shipping container that had very minimal um, anything available. There was no like climate control. Um, hanging was available through the pipe on the wall. So it was very um, interesting to kind of interact with the space 
in this way. So I chose to get a lot of clay and over 10 weeks I um, changed it frequently. If something fell over or broke, I would just incorporate it into the space again. I would move things around. I had participants um, come by and like play with clay, which was an interesting new thing for me. Um, and a close up, this is maybe like two or three other forms that became one new form and I think informed some things for me that I'm curious about exploring within this residency. Like I'm curious about um, raw material and also thinking about how I can reproduce things. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm at with my work. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Annie Goldman, and I'm a painter. And lately my work has been drawing from Kabbalistic teachings and biblical stories, <clears throat> sorry, and interpreting them in a midrashic mode of thinking. And this lets you do a lot of different things. You can zoom into or explode out a single word. You can read in between lines of text. You can free associate and it's just a way to bring ancient writing into the immediate present. There's been a lot of animals in the paintings too, and they perform a lot of different functions. So this painting is Thumb Girl Talks to God. All the paintings are about like six by six feet or six by five feet. So Thumb Girl is this cross figure you see here, and she is my thumb. I've always been really insecure about my wide nail bed thumbs. So <laughs> she's become, <clears throat> Sorry, she's become, oh, going backwards. She's become this character, um, and this is her and some cats, and they're going through a spiritual metamorphosis on a journey to talk to God. In Kabbalah, there's this teaching that the first time that God's name was transcribed, it was written in 42 different letters, in 40 diff 42 different colors, with light emitting in 42 different directions. So that's the 42 letters that we have in the triangle. This is snake versus monkey. And this is my Garden of Eden painting. Um, the snake is squeezing out of the monkey its animalness. Um, and out of its ear is falling all this undescribed language, uncontrolled language. And then there's this border of snakes. And beyond that is this holy formed letters. This is the whale. There's some fake theories of evolution going on. Uh, in the upper left corner is a sperm whale mouth and out of it is coming this form that is like the diagram of the layers of inferno. <clears throat> and the sperm whale has this organ called a spermaceti, which like scientists don't know what the function of it is. There's just these little floating organisms that are referred to as spermaceti. So this is my John Adams and George Washington making love in the spermaceti. <laughs> this is cat ketubah. A ketubah is a marriage contract. And this is marriage contract between woman and cat. You can read into that as you would like. I think it's a metaphor for something. Maybe lesbianism. <laughs> this is Shekhinah knows herself. Um, Shekhinah in Kabbalah, there's this big idea of when couples on earth have sex, they're facilitating this cosmic union beti between Shekhinah and Seferet, which are the feminine and masculine sides of God. So this is my like femme on femme version, like Shekhinah and Shekhinah coming together. Thanks so much. Hello, I'm Allie. Um, I'm based in Los Angeles, and my practice is um, research-based. Um, I do a lot of <clears throat> field work in my work. Um, I'm going to talk about two projects because they take forever to explain. Um, this project, I worked with my collaborator. We lived on an artificial island inside of Kennedy Space Center, 
and the work was looking at the landscape of the Space Center, <clears throat> which also sits inside of a wildlife refuge. So considering the boundary between natural and artificial, um, the Space Center is filled with thousands of islands that were formed by dredging. So looking at um, this land as sort of a new planet. And we designed and built our habitat and all of the tools we used to investigate the island and our outfits. And it was awful because it was July in Florida in a place called Moschino Lagoon. So it was very uncomfortable. Um, and that work came together as an exhibition at Atlantic Center for the Arts in New Smyrna Beach, which is about 45 minutes north of Kennedy Space Center. Um, where we showed our habitat and some hybrid objects that we created, like sort of imagining um, what would happen if these highly technological objects being created for space travel combined with natural um, organisms and elements. Um, so my work often exists as like a performance, um, photography, video, sculpture, and installation. And alongside this exhibition, we also held a public program that invited people out to our island um, on kayaks, and we had a like a concurrent geodesic dome on the island, and we had people talking about the history of terraforming in the region, so this idea of like earth moving, um, looking at um, it from a very long lineage dating back to indigenous people building middens to um, sort of like Elon Musk's plan to terraform Mars. Um, and this is the project I'm working on here. So I did a residency at a place called Rabbit Island, which is an um, uninhabited, undivided island in Lake Superior. Um, so I lived there for two summers for a month with another collaborator. Um, and it's a, you live in two lean-tos, so you don't, you're not really protected from the elements, and it's a kind of an extreme environment. So while we were there, we became obsessed with the weather. So we created these weather stations that had to be taken apart, put together every day. And they're wedged into rock. And so um, there were like sort of waterproof paper, different types of paper all over the place. And we created um, sort of automatic drawings every hour. Um, and so I'm working on like sort of synthesizing all the material from this work, which includes like video, underwater audio, underwater video, sound, um, draw, and hundreds of drawings of this rock that make me feel like a totally insane person when I look at them all together. Um, but yeah, my work is really looking at like ecological systems and how do we, how do we um, attempt to classify and contain nature. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carrie Kaneda Meyer, and I'm here in the ceramic studio working with my sometimes but not always best friend Clay. Um, I'm a lifelong artist, but another passion of mine has always been the environment. So many years ago, I did um, graduate work in forest and environmental science, as well as doctoral work in environmental and natural resource economics. And I worked as an economist with a specialty in water economics, as well as the economics of protected areas. And I was also a full-time parent for many years and learned a lot from that. Um, so all of my work is driven by ecological and ecosystem narratives. I tend to work by initially making a large-scale vessel. This is about 28 inches. And um, that becomes sort of my canvas upon which to build. This first piece is entitled Sea Stars Calling. And it's meant to be a dialogue about the collapse of sea star populations along the Pacific coast from Northern California to Washington State. Um, sea stars are dying in record numbers due to sea star wasting disease which is likely attributable to um, a rise in ocean temperatures. And as a keystone species, this has led to the proliferation of sea urchins, which was the main prey species of sea stars. 
So the sea stars used to eat all the sea urchins, and with no sea stars preying on them, the sea urchin population has exploded, and sea urchins eat new kelp spores, the new growth on kelp, which in the tangled web that ecosystems are, has caused a collapse in the kelp forests along the Pacific coast. And, you know, kelp forests provide not only incredible crucial habitat, but they also sequester more carbon than terrestrial forests. So this next piece is an homage to bull kelp, which for decades, if you ever watch, walk the beaches of Northern California, um, this species was all over the place, often dozens of feet long, and now it's mostly gone. I also love examining the intricate structure of things like seed, seed pods and pollens and tree bark, and this piece is evoking pollen. I'm also very compelled by ecosystem processes, such as dispersion of nutrients, which this piece focuses on. And um, this is an example of uh, the water cycle and the importance of free flowing and seasonal movement of water. This is called fluvial horns. So my work is gradually becoming more and more location specific, really embracing a sense of place. And so here at the ranch, I'm looking forward to finding local materials, local clays, um, found objects, and hopefully incorporating them into my work. I like to think of nature as my collaborator, and I'm super excited to see where this mountain ecosystem takes me. I'm also very grateful to be here. Thanks. Okay, and if it's possible to do it without the sound, it will be great, so I can speak while okay, okay. We can also just do the video without the images. I'll just run the video. Okay, cool. So I'm an art. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist, currently based in Brooklyn. And my practice kind of very traverse multi discipline from drawing and printmaking to large-scale architectural um, installations, that my interest is to create work that revolves around the human body in relation to space. And I'm curious how architectural environment and physical objects shapes our movement and our stability and the way that we traverse spaces and how we can rethink the way that um, material and objects shapes the way that we interact with it. In this case, I create this kind of a bridge that cross two sides of the room. Um, it starts from my friend. It actually pierced the wall, so it starts from the other side of the wall, go through the other side to the left, uh, from my friend's um, studio uh, to the exhibition space to another corridor on the other side, so you could kind of see the tip of the sculpture emerged from outside until you're entering the space and being blocked by this rotating bridge. And it will orient, it kind of orient the audience that become some sort of dancers that need to cross through and walk around it. Um, this project I called Puzzle, it starts from thinking about a room side sculpture and how I can create some sort of or choreography in the space and how people and the audience could kind of move and change their orientation and they would create different kind of entrance and exit. So it's always about some sort of a dance between relationship between the person and the audience and me as an artist starting trying to create some sort of new scenarios for you to engage with your surrounding. Um, this sculpture started from reading a Borges um, a story that's called the Death in the Compass, and there was like some one striking moment that 
I, I call, I titled it at, as a, uh, a part of the, shit, it's running really fast. So I'm not gonna tell you. Um, uh, that, that was my thesis show last year. Um, I was dreaming about this corner of a building. It was a large scale, a full size corner of a building that I wanted it to kind of have their own life in the space. So I create this massive um, mechanism that kind of made it like elevated very slowly and collapsed like in some sort of um, repetitive motion. Um, and that will be it. So that's it. Ha, that's really fast. Hello. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Forgot I was super tall for a minute. My name is Sherelle Chillick. I am a painter, a fabulous painter at that. Um, and I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I currently live in Flint. Ooh, let me go back. <clears throat> so I arranged these images. Well, this is not the first one. Okay, there we go. So I arranged these images from the past to present. And I'm just gonna talk about these pieces. This piece, um, I did this in my first residency in 2014. I was living in Washington Heights, um, upstate, well, not upstate, what am I talking about? Upper, you know, New York. And um, <laughs> in Manhattan, Washington Heights, Manhattan. And I was taking in my location where I was at, what the people looked like who lived around me and all of the posters and all the things that I would see on the wall and I'll take it back to my studio in Brooklyn and I just made this piece. Um, at the time, and I still am obsessed with heads, floating heads, um, portraits, and just capturing likeness. So that's what I started there and I'm still obsessed with this piece. Also, about this location, um, besides my rent being crazy expensive, I was really fascinated with just location in general. So location, text, and culture and identity. So it was important for me to put those things in my pieces. So I have writings like Washington Heights, Audubon, 168th. That was the train that I would take and things like that. So after I came back from my residency in New York, I was back in Detroit and I was still interested in heads portraiture, all that good stuff, but I was more interested in faith-based works. So this location that I started with was actually my high school. My high school is right up the street from my college. And I was still playing with text, layering, um, just busy paintings. I just like a lot of stuff. Um, and so with this piece, it's seriously it's like screen printing. It's hand applied, um, ink, pencil, it's just a lot of stuff, y'all. I, I can't even remember. It's just so much. It was just a lot of stuff. At, when I was working on this painting, this is 2017. I just moved to Flint because I got married. And I was like, man, I miss Detroit. And so at this time, I started to really make work that featured like family, friends, and the location being important again, being Detroit. This is right across the street from my college, and this is a picture of my little cousin, Chrissy. I tend to paint my little cousins a lot. And with this work, I'm still playing with faith-based, um, Christian faith-based texts in words hidden in plain sight. So it's kind of hard to see, but it says he is alive. And the street that this painting is on is Woodward. And that is a real sign, so don't call that number up there. Okay, <laughs> so fast forward. This is when I was in Vegas. Well, anticipating going to Vegas in 2022, yes. So I was like, man, I'm so tired of Flint. Oh my goodness, I'm so tired of Flint. So I was looking forward to Vegas and I was like, I'm gonna capture some of my social media friends who live in Vegas. 
And I kind of input my stories. In, well, I use their faces to tell my stories. And so it was just, the name of this painting is called Getaway. Um, all of these pieces are mostly done with acrylic as well. But I was just wanted to play with desert landscape and just being anywhere but here, I guess. That's pretty much the theme of all of these places since they're so location important. And this is the last piece. This is of my beautiful friend, Ivan. Um, yeah, so like I said, another head, because I'm obsessed with beautiful heads and faces. So this piece is just to show off, to be honest. But because, like I said, he's just a beautiful man. And so I was playing with, <laughs> I was playing with the idea of location, but it being not a, like a physical location, but like a mental space. Um, this painting was taking, this painting was came from a video still of him when he was healing from an injury where he was a hit and run injury. And he was telling me how he was like in this hazy space and he couldn't really like, he was having to take this medicine and these drugs and he was just like completely out of it. And I was like, you cannot tell because you're so beautiful. Um, but yeah, so the, while I'm here, I'm still working on a series. It's really, it's called Anywhere But Here. And it's still location based. And yeah, that's all I gotta say. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Catherine Lucky Chang. I'm here in the printmaking department and I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Uh, so I primarily make paper, print, paint, and draw on my paper. My work is about love, joy, and wholeness and is really inspired by being in the present moment and a sense of wholeness. Um, so this one is a pulp painting. So the painting process is actually done during the paper making process. And um, I'm really thinking in my work a lot about the image and the paper working together in harmony. So thinking about ideas of Eastern philosophies of not just something going on top of the item, but the two interplaying together. Here's one of etching and chinquile. So I'm hoping to work on some etchings while I'm here. Again, thinking about not just the plate and sticking with the image, but interweaving with the actual paper and bringing them together. Here's another one of a pulp painting. Um, I, my work also thinks about and interweaves my meditation practice. So I think a lot about ritual and repetition in terms of a daily meditation practice, as well as play and presence. So I think uh, bringing in elements of play in terms of shape, color, texture. Um, and I think I have a video as well. So this is just a time lapse of me making paper. Uh, I was able to build this deckle box with the help of amazing friends. And I, it's about six and a half, six by seven feet or so. And so I use the deckle box paper making process where I put the pulp and the water inside of the box on top of a piece of plastic and then I pull the tarp out and it lays onto the paper. And then here is uh, an example of that specific size that came from that box. And um, this incorporates monotype with chinquile. And uh, I'm also interested in printing with 
wooden blocks and uncarved blocks, thinking about non-doing, effortless flow, and uh, there's this Taoist idea of Wu Wei, which is effortless flow, where they use the uncarved block as that metaphor. So thinking about incorporating that into my work. And um, yeah, so I'm really excited to hopefully take all of these different pieces together and experiment and play and see what I come up with here. Thank you guys so much. Hi, my name is Christy. Um, I am working in the ceramics studio this month. Um, I'm from the Bay Area and live in Santa Cruz, California. Um, I don't even remember what slides I sent in, so we'll see what we get. <laughs> um, yeah, so the last couple years, I've been really focusing on this research that I've been doing about um, Chinese diaspora fishermen who lived and worked in the Monterey Bay and San, and San Francisco Bay um, during like the pre-gold rush, post-gold rush era. Um, and I think uh, the, I was doing this research about them because I had read the statistic that at some point one in like one in four people in Santa Cruz County was of Chinese descent. And when I moved there, I was like, no. <laughs> um, and where I grew up, I also like didn't grow up with people who looked like me. So I was really interested in kind of understanding like, how did this happen? Like, why, why does this place look the way it does? Um, and so started digging into these like diasporic histories and learned a lot of stuff. And so, um, they were sort of relegated to the coastlines to fish and live there because they weren't allowed to live anywhere else and um, basically created this like fishing industry and when it became successful it was like another reason for pe for them to get pushed out and policies were passed so that like they weren't allowed to like fish there or live there anymore and so they were like those policies were sort of what the precursors, the Chinese Exclusion Act. So I was really interested in this history and like these lives and like who were these people and like what were they doing and none of their names are recorded, like they their graves don't have names. So I was really interested in sort of this like haunted like missingness of these memories and these lives. And so one of the ways that I started to kind of like uncover these stories was I made a series of Joss paper and Joss's um, a paper that's like ritually burned. Um, it's like an ancestral veneration practice. So you like burn it and like through the act of burning it, it's sort of like transmitting um, and like transforming something that's sent to the afterlife, sent to like the ancestral plane or whatever. Um, and this was also a practice that in my family had been erased because of like spiritual colonization. So my family converted to Christianity and sort of like gave up all of our like traditional practices. So I was really interested in sort of like reclaiming or trying to like grasp at these memories that are just lost. So I made this piece, this is a piece of Joss paper that I made and printed with sand that's from the beaches where um, some of these fishing settlements were. This is a more recent installation of handmade jaw. So I was I, I learned to make paper and inside of the paper embedded um, elements from the sites as well. So I included pieces of seaweed, um, dead and dried fish, and sort of thinking about like, okay, like I want it to also sort of evoke like a sensual memory. So when they're burned, they smell like fish, it smells like low tide. That was also a smell that was like written into policy of like a reason to push people out. Um, so I'm really interested in like also kind of this intersection of material memory and history and also like like archival and like I don't know people history and where and kind of filling in the blanks um, because I couldn't find very much in like the archival histories. I started visiting these sites and, think, and sort of interacting with the materials themselves. Um, and I also spend a lot of time on the coast and in the ocean and like immersed in these elements. So I really wanted to like engage and collaborate with these materials. And sort of my thinking was like, okay, if like the memory is lost, like people don't remember these things anymore, 
but the materials and the landscapes are ancient. And so like by invoking them, I can also sort of like invoke the memory that they have of these places and these people. Um, and this is sort of the most recent works that I've been doing. They're sort of like, um, like altar vessels or like reliquaries or incense sensors. They're based off of fish forms. Um, and this is photographed at the site of one of the fishing villages. Sort of thinking about like alternative histories, but also alternative like futures. So like what, what could life look like if we aren't constantly like violently displacing people and, and settling like what sort of, yeah, like thinking like into like the speculative future of things. Um, so yeah, I'm very recently in ceramics. So these are like the more, this is probably the vein of the work I'll be following while at the ranch. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hazel. Um, I'm a filmmaker and video artist. I live in LA and I'm from New Jersey. Um, can we play the film first? Oh. Maybe we could. So this is um, a short narrative film I finished last year called Sydney and Kim. We can just watch. And the time goes on the film, huh? Yes. We are going to eat beautiful sister in our cute hotel room. We are going to be sweet companions. I will be a sick cocoon. Yeah. And it will be special to be my tail twins. I'll bring you yummy snacks. We can make mine. I'm so uh, emotional growth yeah. goals. Sydney, wait. I just remember this really funny review of our motel. Kim, I really have to pee. Oh my god, Angel. Of course, sorry. Hurry up. There's someone coming. Hallie says I need to stop over involving myself in other people's relationships, but like we did date for almost a year. I don't know. Do you think maybe I'm overstepping? Wait, but Kim, can I say something? Yeah. What's up? Um, I don't know, I'm like, kind of uh, annoyed that you were so late. I hear you. And I promise I'll be better with planning. It was just, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm here now. Say it. Thanks for saying something. I know sometimes it can be hard for you to voice disappointment. Cool. So that's just a taste. Um, this, yeah, it's so it's about these two best friends, one of whom is taking care of the other one after a surgery and their friendship kind of falls apart. Um, but I think um, a lot of my work is about relationships that are formed or fall apart in care, in care work, when we're forced to take care of our friends and family when we don't necessarily have the tools. Um, or when our best friends are also our therapists, are also our like nurses. Um, so this is an installation about um, kind of, it's kind of a shrine. Um, it was like my attempt to do some sort of ancestor worship um, to this woman, Salka, who is one of the first 
trans femme porn stars. Um, and I, I feel like a lot of artists recently have been like thinking through like, who are my ancestors? Like, how do I reclaim some type of like connection? Um, and I was like, who are my ancestors? Who are my ancestors? Like, what if, what if they're porn stars, you know? Um, so I was thinking through like how to create like a type of sacredness with folks, um, kind of like looking back to folks who were, you know, pushed into these really exploitative situations because that's all there was. Um, and who are, should also be celebrated for, you know, surviving HIV AIDS, surviving being sex workers, surviving um, getting gender affirming treatment in, from the black market. Um, so this installation is a kind of like a recreation of a, a set from one of her porn films. So this would have been in like the early 80s. Um, so you can't see it, but it's kind of in the lower left uh, corner TV. Um, and that's actually Ron Jeremy, um, who was in that film with her. But she, in, in that scene, she's watching herself in previous porn films. So I thought it was such a beautiful moment and I wanted to, to kind of reimagine what that space actually looked like. Um, and also thinking about like, m the first trans femme people I saw were porn stars um, or were like these random women on Howard Stern would bring them in and be like, laugh at them. Um, and so what does it mean to like learn your gender or like your, who you are or who you can be through TV? Um, and the TV as kind of this mirror stage uh, that certain folks go through. Um, and then along with, you can kind of see it on the bottom. I did an interview. I know, Mo, I know Sulka's still around somewhere, but I wasn't able to track her down, but I interviewed her ex BFF who liked the other film. They had like a chaotic falling out. Um, but just about being trans femme in the 80s in LA and what that was like for them. So that interview kind of plays as you move through the space and watch the videos of her. Um, and I'm working on a feature length screenplay while I'm here. So I'll just be on the computer in the basement, but come say hi. Um, and yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks.